And something was telling me like, if you do not let go of, like I, I just felt like I was like one leg in, one leg out. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't, even though I had autonomy in my corporate job, I still like mentally was like, them people had me, I couldn't get out. You know what I'm saying? I was like, I just couldn't, it was like one or the other. Yeah. You know, you're either gonna go all in for X amount of time or you're gonna stick to the corporate thing. What's going on, family? Welcome to another episode of the Traffic, Sales, and Profit Show. My name is Lamar Tyler. I'm your host. And if you are a black entrepreneur looking for ways to build your business or to tap into more ways to generate wealth, you're in the right spot. And today, we're talking about the business of food, right? And I'm here with one of my mastermind fam and very good friend, Tiffany Neal, creator, right? The creative, <laughs> the founder, the genius behind Barlow's Foods. What's going on, Tiffany? Hey, how are you? I'm doing good and I'm excited about today because I wanted to talk about the food business. Okay. Because I'm always interested when people want to build a business around food and like, like what is their background? What is their story? What's their interest in it? And then what's the vision? Yeah. Because one of the things from the very first time I met you that struck, I never told you this, so you're probably like, what is this thing that you do? <laughs> For the very first time I met you, it struck me that you're approaching the food business differently. Because so many times in our community, when we think about, like we have a long legacy of entrepreneurship through food in a black right. community, but it's mostly through us owning and operating food venues, restaurants, soul food joints, carryouts, right? But you said I'm a building a iconic brand, a new iconic brand based around good, wholesome, down home breakfast foods, right. at least initially. And that is what blew my mind. But it's like, is that a good... Uh, explanation, you know, from the outside looking in? Sell it, okay? Okay, I'm here for it. So, yes, but thank you so much for having me. Um, so, yeah, like usually we are, we're selling plates, you know, out of the trunk, uh, doing pop-ups and restaurants and all those things, and I think that they're all needed. Um, I've always loved food, so I feel like I have been a foodpreneur for a majority of my life. Like, I've always been somewhere in the kitchen or taking food from somewhere, right? Like, just eating. Like, I've always loved to do that. So, um, a little bit of about my uh, passion and about my past. Um, my mom, my dad have always been like the big cooks in the family. Um, but you know, I got them now. <laughs> okay, okay. Like, now they don't really have anything on me, but- um, Do they agree with that? Right. When is this all air? When, no. when, they, say, when they watch this, I mean, that's not real good. Just me no, you no, they, they, they know, yeah. Okay. Because I feel like, you know, we stepped up. We've learned from our <laughs> mistakes. We're making things a little bit cleaner nowadays. But no, um, absolutely. So I'm from California originally. Okay. Um, and I moved to Atlanta. I moved to Georgia maybe like 14 years or so ago. Mm. And at that time, I was like, you know, pescatarian, vegetarian, kind of in between, right? But just like a really cleaner eater at that time. And when I was moving here, everyone was like, what are you going to eat when you move to Atlanta? And I never thought about that, right? I was thinking about finding my place, you know, I don't know, like just getting acclimated, finding friends and, you know, getting work and stuff together. Like the food thing, even though I love to, you know, eat yeah. or love food, it wasn't really at the top of my mind at that, you know, at that point in time. And probably 14 years ago, different landscape yes. as far as options than it is today. Yeah. Probably much different. But still great, right? Okay. So when I moved here, um, I realized like, oh my gosh, there are a lot of restaurants. And I actually had a boutique. So several years ago, okay. I had a store. I was doing the online thing before it was like really popping. Um, and it unfortunately did not work out for me, right, financially. But it was a great learning experience. And so for that reason, I was relocating, you know, getting my feet back on the ground. Um, and when I moved here, I realized it's so many restaurants. I didn't have anyone to really, you know, go to those restaurants with. I didn't want to be, you know, the lonely lady in the corner <laughs> eating her meal by herself. So I'm like, okay, I want to go out to these restaurants. I wanted to revamp my business some type of way, but I didn't have anyone to sell it to. So I started this like food club, I guess, so to speak. It was okay. called Bon Appetit Atlanta. And um, we would go around to different restaurants. It was like me, a bunch of women who I thought would be my target market for this new store I wanted to open, right? And we would just start going to restaurants. So it just kind of started there, right? And I started to go out to all these different restaurants. And I'm like, 
like, well, I know I can, you know, make this a little bit uh, better or do this a little bit differently because I've always cooked. Um, I did the food blogging thing for a little bit and it just really wasn't like substantial enough for me. So finally, I had always thought like maybe I could do my own sauces or do my own product, but nothing was sticking. Um, I thought about seasonings, you know, going into that with my dad, but that was you know, he was on a whole nother level. <laughs> like that didn't work out. Um, and so literally one day I was making breakfast. Um, and at this time, I'm like 10 years into my corporate career, you know, food thing is like still a hobby. Making breakfast one day for a friend and it's just he and I there. And he's like, oh my gosh, these pancakes are so good. Like you put your foot in these pancakes. I had always made them. Mm. And I was like, I did put my foot in these pancakes, okay? <laughs> I did. <laughs> and I, for some reason, like it was an aha moment. And I just got obsessed with the idea of making a pancake mix, right? Acting like Aunt Jemima and Bisquick and all the other people didn't exist. I don't know why, I just got obsessed. And it was like, you have to do this. So every time I would go somewhere, if I was traveling, if I was you know, at a coffee shop, if I would turn the radio on, it's like a song would have pancakes in it. As soon as I turn the radio, wow. that's the word I'm hearing. So I'm like, this is definitely the a sign. Signs, the signs are coming from all over I'm, the place. It sounds crazy, but it's so true. And so I was like, okay, I have to do this. So now what am I going to call, you know, this brand? And so I started like making samples. I would send them to friends and family. And so everybody was kind of like, for the most part, you know, you're on to something. Um, but then I didn't have a name for it. So I'm like, okay, kind of back to square one. I'm still in my corporate job. Um, and I'm sitting at my desk one day and my desk is always, I do try to clean up, but things happen. So it's always a mess. And for some reason, my grandfather's photo, like I moved some stuff around mm. and my grandfather, um, whose name is Barlow, um, Barlow Harris, his photo was on my desk. And I don't know why, again, I'm like, Barlow's. I'm going to name it Barlow's because for one, my grandfather, but then two, we have a deeper history into like agriculture and farming. So that was pretty much like just his way of making a living. And I feel like back in the day, right, that was very often, right, that those in our communities would go to like farming or agriculture just yes. out of a means to make it. And, and a lot of times I think that's a forgotten part of our legacy. Yes. Like we think that we were just like born and planted in these major yes. urban metropolitan cities, but that ain't really who we are at the core of us as people. Yeah, I mean, at the core, we are farmers, right? And we've gotten so far away from that. Um, and I really, I want to get my hands dirty. I love to, that's something for later, but that's something I want to, you know, get <laughs> into more. But, you know, just knowing that about him, seeing his photo, knowing I needed a name, I felt like it was kind of Divine, like a full so. circle moment. Um, so then I was excited again, and <laughs> I was like off to the races, right? So like, now, like, what do we do? Like, how do I, I need, you know, graphic design. I need, you know, a food scientist to come in, nutrition labels, et cetera. Like, I mean, everything just really started at that moment. Okay, so this is good. I got a ton of questions. So, okay. All right, so um, back me up. The boutique. Yes. When you made the <laughs> jump um, from the boutique, right? The boutique was in California. It was. And coming to Atlanta, what lessons... Because I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a big believer in everything that we've done previously leads us to this point. Yes. What lessons did you take from the boutique? Whatever level of success it had, didn't have, but, but not working to the degree you wanted, that you're now applying to this business. So find real tax people, first of all, okay? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. That is a good right, one. Right, okay? We don't want the lady doing the tax hookup. But no, I mean, um, just financially, right? Just doing things smarter um, and utilizing your resources. Like, of mm. course, hindsight is twenty twenty. But, like, if I would have really been, like, into social, I'm a little bit of an introvert. So if I would have been, like, into social media and, you know just, you know, more like just aware of what was happening. I could have taken more advantage of that. Mm. So I'm really trying to incorporate that now, right? Collaborations, um, the Instagrams and all that stuff that's like out of my out of my comfort zone, right? But um, just embracing those things and really having a plan, I would say, you know, but like I, I joke about the tax lady, right? But seriously, like, you can't just take people's word for face value. You got to do your due diligence and make sure that they have your best interests and that you're hiring people to really do what 
they say they're going to do, what they advertise they can do, what they also have the receipts, right, to back that up. So just making sure that um, that things are just like an order, I think would be the, the biggest thing. Um, and just really going for it. I feel like I kind of played small then, right? I was, mm. I didn't know any other entrepreneurs. And then this is one of the biggest things. So I lost a lot of friends between that period, <laughs> probably up until, so I was probably early 20s at that time. I don't remember. I felt like 20 three-ish maybe. Um, so between like then, like maybe like a five-year span, it's like I really found out who like my true people were mm, because okay. a lot of us were just coming out of college, right? And, um, you know, I'm still hustling, right? I was still eating, you know, whatever I needed to eat at that time to survive. It wasn't, I mean, it looked kind of bigger than what it was, I guess, for those that didn't have, you know, entrepreneurs in their family or sure. they weren't familiar with it. So, um you know, a lot of friction in relationships um, at that time, which is kind of sad, right? Yeah. But I think that it definitely conditioned me for, you know, everything that's happening now and what's going to happen in the future. So it sounds like a lot of, during that span, a lot of both personal and professional growth. Absolutely. Like around the business and in life that taught you lessons. Yes. Again, that just would prepare you for later on down the line. Yeah. Now, when you got to Atlanta, uh, this is this first part of the story is so good. You got to Atlanta. I love how you talked about the fact that um, it was something that you wanted to do and you essentially created like a, almost like a mini business around it, right? Yes. You said like, I just want to try out restaurants. Yes. But I didn't want to go alone. Right. Um, and essentially probably sounds like you found other people that were thinking the same thing, right? Yes. There was a niche, there was a market, there was a space for it. And you found other people. Um, and in and, and doing that, like this interesting, I think so many times people have things they're interested in and they see a need, but they don't do anything. Right. Right. So they sit there like saying, I wish somebody would get something together. Right. Like how many times somebody came and she's like, I, I wish somebody would do this thing because this thing is needed. Exactly. You basically created a thing that's needed. And even though that wasn't the thing that would blow all the way up, it sounds like it was part of what led to the actual thing that blew up and, you know, got you in front of more food, got you in front of thinking about more things around food and ways you could do things better. Yeah. That, that was interesting. Yeah. As you went to those different places and you said you would say, hey, you know, um, I would change this, I would do this. Was mostly around the food, was around the actual operations of the restaurant, was around service. Like, what were the things that you would notice? Oh, I'm a food critic. <laughs> <laughs> it was all food, okay? No, but it was majority of food. I mean, of course, like, service and stuff would, you know, come up. But for the most part, I mean, at some of these restaurants, you know, I can be a little bougie. So some of the restaurants were, like, nicer on the higher end. I'm like, if they're charging this and doing this, you know, I can definitely you know, I can do this, you know, I can do something, something like this. Like I know I'm always tinker, tinkering around in the kitchen. So I'm like, I knew that it was something there, but I do think, like you said, to your point, it was just kind of all a part of the journey. I love it. I love yeah. it. And then I love how you say everything comes together in the culmination of trying to um, discover what the product will be, getting clarity on what the product will be, and then trying to discover the name in that moment of clarity uh, with your grandfather's picture. Yes. And, and then tying in his history to all of it as well. Um, I love it. Now, was your, your grandfather, was he a farmer in California? He was. So people always ask, they're like, in California? Because that was my next question. Really? Yeah, you know, East Coast people, we struggle with the whole California thing. So what do you think about California? Um, You know what? Like, so <laughs> We're just peace and... Yeah, aloof. you know. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> What's no just really going on? <laughs> no judgment here. But... All right. Like, I know what it is because I got, you know, I got friends and clients out in California. But I think a lot of people in general relate California to LA. Okay. Well, California is so much more than LA, right? It is. Um, Cause I've been to Sacramento. Sacramento is totally different than LA, right? Right. You know, the Bay Area is exactly. totally different, right? And then every other place, San Diego, I've been in totally different, right? And then every other place in between is so just, I think what most people on the East Coast don't realize is how large California actually so, is. Exactly. And how different all those different pieces of California actually is. But I think what most people think of, what they think about is, you know, is LA. Yeah, so, Hollywood. Yeah, so, you know, but I, I'm just curious. <laughs> you know, so, I mean, so when you think of like, hey, if somebody said, hey, you know what? I had a black grandfather. That was a farmer. You know what I'm saying? He got, he literally got it from the dirt. He put his hands in his earth and created things. And you would probably think from the South. Right. And well, now you live in Georgia. So, you know, it just would, you know, it would tie things together. But it's yeah. like an interesting story. It makes it even more interesting. So technically, well, we're all right. Like we're all a combination of like 
migration and Correct. you know we we come from all from all over right um but my grandfather so his roots he was born in texas okay so he moved to california maybe as like a preteen i want to say i don't know exactly right but he spent majority of his life in california so i'm only gonna say this one time did you like what you just heard well let me tell you about this real quick we want to expose you to something that's amazing and that is the tsp mastermind if you are a business owner that's trying to reach your next six, seven, or eight figures in business, and you're looking for a community of like-minded, purpose-driven, and ethical entrepreneurs, then guess what? You're in the right spot. We have a 12-month program with one-on-one -on -one coaching, accountability, trainings, events, and more in order to help you reach the next level in your business. For more information, visit www.trafficsalesandprofit.com. So I'm only going to say this one time, okay? <laughs> I'm from a very small town in California called Bakersfield. <laughs> I don't even want to say it, right? Bakersfield. But shout out to Bakersfield, okay? okay? So Bakersfield is in Kern County, and it's like central California-ish. So it's about 45 minutes outside of Los Angeles County. Um, and that is like farm country, right? So it's tons of agriculture. Um, I mean, you know, when you hit the exit, I mean, you smell it, right? It's livestock. I mean, everything is out there. So a ton of our produce does come from California, y'all. <laughs> Hey, you Get go. it together. Y'all learn all kind of new stuff. I only know. On the it's going on. <laughs> all right. Well, I yeah, people it. think that all the time. But yeah, so from California. Um, and yeah, so I mean, it actually is a thing. So. Okay. So you get clarity on, okay, this is the brand. Is this we naming it? What's the first step in actually saying, okay, I'm going to create an actual product around pancakes? So pancakes, for one, because I knew that I didn't have to re-educate people, right? So I'm like, mm -hmm. I feel like everybody and their mom, for, for the most part, you know, knows what pancakes are and they enjoy them or they eat them. They are, yeah. have some type of relationship there. If people don't like pancakes, I judge them. <laughs> I'm letting you know this now. They like, need to I be really judged, judge okay? I think people don't eat pancakes are suspect. <laughs> <laughs> just my they, they need to be judged. But no, so that was the first thing, right? Let's just start. Let's get our foot in the door with that, right? And do this really well. Um, so once I did that, I did a whole bunch of stuff. So at first, I'm very, you know, I have a very aesthetic. I also went to school in the arts. Okay. Um, but so I wanted things to look very, like, nostalgic. And no judgment to you, but I feel like men sometimes, if you ever, like, tell a man to go to the grocery store and pick up something, you got to be very specific or else you might get whatever they pick up. I don't know. <laughs> so I was like, okay, I want this to look kind of generic -y, right? Like I want even if I gave this note to my man to say, go get me some pancake mix, I want him to pick this pancake mix. So that kind of mm -hmm. went into like the branding aspect. So finding um, like a graphic designer to get the packaging and all that stuff together because I really wanted people before you taste or eat something, you have to be attracted to the packaging, right? Correct. Or yes. you want to, like it has to make you want to know more about the product. So that was a major thing. Um, I did a lot of classes. So I went to like canning classes, classes on making like syrups and, you know, just how to put different food and different things together because I was doing it in my kitchen. But as I learned early on, like me, I was initially trying to take like the exact thing I was doing at home and like packaging it up. And like I was taking yes. like, you know, if I put an egg in it at home, we're going to do some dry egg in the mix. And one of my girlfriends, she was like, this tastes like cornbread. So that didn't work. <laughs> OK, <laughs> that didn't work out. So I found that you it's not always like a one for one swap with things. Um, and then you got, you know, shelf life and stability and all these other things that you have to deal with. So it was just a lot of, you know, research, um, getting tied in with um, UGA, University of Georgia. They have mm -hmm. a huge agriculture department um, and food department. So if there's anyone local that is interested in starting, that is a great starting point. Um, the costs are usually reduced, right? When you're trying to get like your nutrition labels done, testing, et cetera, they're there to help. And, and that's a great point. I want to make sure people pick up what you just talked about because I've had a lot of entrepreneurs in, you know, all, all across the country, right, yes. that have said, hey, you know what, I was able to tap into my local college yes. to get access to Bright Minds and the resource, like you said, at a fraction of the cost. Yes. And sometimes, you know, the college even have um, programs where they actually select businesses and they focus on that business with everyone at no cost, right? So yes. um, I love the fact that you tapped in mm -hmm. and got a hold of that instead of all trying to do it on yourself, which I think is a mistake entrepreneurs often make too many yeah. times. And that was the thing too, like just, you know, tapping into that, um, you know, wanting to find and be around other people that were in the food industry, um, just trying to figure out like, who do I know that knows someone else or, you know, trying to just find, find those people. So that was a really big thing for me. Um, and yeah, I think that that is, you know, pretty much the hit, like history from there. Um, 
And it just like once I would get tied in with someone like I think it was Department of Agriculture, then they would kind of put me in touch with someone else. Right. And it's just like the chain. It just kept adding and building momentum. And then, you know, we were doing a lot of um, pop ups and markets like on the belt line, chasing people down the belt line with pancakes that didn't work out uh that well. <laughs> so so but. one of the things that stood out to me when I very first saw it, like you said, was the actual packaging. Yes. And how professional and how clean the packaging looked. And it looked shelf ready. Yes. To me, right? Because I think a big mistake that I see oftentimes entrepreneurs make is um when they package, when they brand, when they bottle, when they label, it doesn't look like the stuff in the stores. Exactly. Right? So so I love how you went through that and made sure from the very beginning, it sounds like it was intentional. I was going to ask you about it, but you shared, like, it sounded like it was very intentional from the beginning. Yes. That, hey, I want this to be able to stand right along the other products and the other ones on the shelf and someone be able to, you know, not really distinguish which ones came from, you know, the huge, you know, uh, conglomerates, right, that have been here for hundreds of years and which ones are my actual product. Right. I love that so much. Now, tell me about, um, as you're starting this and launching it, what is the conversation as you're having conversations with people? Are they, like, surprised when you say, hey, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, creating a pancake mix? Are they supportive? Are they not supportive? Are people like, I don't fool with this from a small company, only, you know, do big companies. Do people say, hey, I'd rather support a small company doing this and leave, you know, the ones on the shelves alone because I think this may be healthier and more wholesome. Like, like what was the feedback you were getting? Yeah, so I've heard it all, um, mm. really. So I try not to talk too much about things. I just try to, like, just do it, right? Because yeah. I feel like I might get talked out of it. So it wasn't too much talking, right? I was like, I'm That's just going to do this. Um, but I did, you know, made a plan before I started selling anything in the like packaging that you know today, I made sure that I just, you know, like loop my family in, right? I want no problem. So <laughs> I wanted to let them know grandpa about to be, you know, on the back of a pancake mix bag. It's okay. It's all That's good. That's a good heads up. That's a good heads up. <laughs> that was a heads up. I just sent everybody a little package, right? Um, and then got to it. So um, I hear everything. I've heard people tell me, oh, I'm not going to support you because I don't want to, you know, get addicted to you're not going to be around. So I've heard that. Wow. Com- I've heard that comment. Um, and I, said, I don't want to, I'm not going like, to support I... you because I don't want to get addicted <laughs> to your food and then you stop making it. Right. I've heard that. That's a wild like, way to think right, right there. I'm like, what you thought about Blockbuster? Okay. What you thought about all these <laughs> other things? I mean, anything can happen. So I've heard that. I've heard um, a lot of people that are, we started like on the farmer's market circuit. Mm -hmm. So those people really appreciate cleaner ingredients. They appreciate local and they get it, you know. So I feel like sometimes in our communities, we want all the sodium, we want all the sugar, we want all the fat. I do too, right? But I feel like there's still a cleaner and better approach to that. So we're a cleaner product. Um, So I do find when I'm on like that side of things when I'm in the farmer's markets and in those communities, they're more, um, I would say like receptive or open, like they're looking for those things that are Mm -hmm. cleaner. So they are, you know, more ready to go when it comes from a smaller company. Um, But it's just been kind of across the board. It kind of depends on what arena I'm in um, and when I'm having those conversations. What was the biggest challenge initially starting out? I would say capital, um, I mentioned the ingredients, like the one for one and the scaling, Um, but I would say definitely capital. So I'm like 100% in this now, right? But when I started, I wasn't. And I come from medical, I was in a medical sales career. So, you know, we do well. Get that money over there. Right. Okay. So it was a big difference, right? And it still is. So just, you know, trying to get myself together that we are not making that money <laughs> anymore, you yet. know? Right. Not yet. 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 Not yet. Yeah, exactly. Um, but it's a huge difference, right? Because, I mean, we can be a little spoiled, you know, in that field. So that was huge. Um, and then just finding, like, I know when I was looking for someone to do the packaging and to do, like, the graphics, I would reach out to these agencies because I wanted my stuff to look professional. Mm-hmm. And um, they were like, oh, it's twenty grand to do, like, a vision board or something crazy. And I'm like, mm. I'm not, you know, even if I had 20 <laughs> grand to give it to you, I'm not giving it, you know, to you for that. Like, especially not at this stage. So just, you know, I had to be scrappy. I found um, my initial graphic designer, like through Instagram and just put some stuff together. and was like, hey, you know, I didn't sketch it out. Now you, you know, make it professional. So I think that that was pretty much, you know, it finding a space to be able to produce, um, you know, produce the product in a space that can grow with you, right? Because some of these incubator, like, kitchens Mm -hmm. and things like that, like, they're good when you're, 
small. I mean, we're still small, right? Mm -hmm. But they're like good when you're maybe, you know, you might go to work, you might not go to work, you might put some storage in there. But as you start to really try and build an operation, it can be more difficult and more um, costly to find, you know, an environment to be able to do that. Yeah. How, how would you, uh, if someone that's watching and they are um, interested and they have like a, a food concept they want to get to market, how would you advise them on making the transition of, hey, getting out of the actual kitchen, right? Or taking that out of the kitchen? Or would you advise them, like, you know, like, because I know that's always a big thing of, you know, should I be making this stuff on my own? Yes. Um, if I'm making the stuff on my own half the time, they're not really following regulations and things about right. making it right. Right. So let's talk about like that process a little bit. Like, how did you learn? you know, what you need to know, and then what would you advise others on? Yeah, so I would say, first of all, just test the concept. And when I say test it, I'm not saying like your husband, your kids, you know mm, what I mean? Like that's good. some real testers, like that are not gonna be afraid to give you the real feedback because they don't really have that connection, right? They're not gonna have to sleep on the couch if they give, <laughs> if they <laughs> give the wrong answer, you know? So I would say get to like like farmer's markets, you know, get out of your, whatever, wherever you're making this stuff, if you're making it at home in the kitchen or wherever, just get out and try, you know, like get some honest feedback. But don't let it deter you, right? Like I already know, like I'm gonna do this, but just be ready to make, you know, some adjustments if needed. Um, and then I would say the more assistance you can get, like the earlier on is the better, right? Because once you start investing in like packaging and things like that, you know, if you're buying 10,000 units of packaging or whatever, you know, hundreds or thousands, you want to make sure that you're going to be able to get through them, right, without right. Yes. having to make any changes or edits. So just simple things like, you know, what address goes on a package label or how do I, you know, list ingredients. So I would say definitely reach out to local, you know, universities for like if you want help from a nutritionist perspective, they can provide that. Um yeah, and just try to get around people who have done, you know, what you're attempting to do and understand too. So the food business, it's like so many different things you can do. When I first mm -hmm. got into this, I initially thought grocery stores. And I think that everybody thinks, oh, you, what store are you in? You know, what, mm -hmm. you in a grocery store? And it's like, okay. Like that's the holy grail. That's like the, right. the prize and, is and to I'm get like, into the, the big ooh. chain grocery store. I mean, it's an option. Right. But it's like, where, what do you want to do? Like, do you want to, you know, make products for other people and, you know, white label and they put their, you know, brand mm -hmm. on it? Um, do you want to be in a grocery store? Do you, what type of stores do you want to be in? Do you want to be in, you know, high end William Sonoma's? Do you want to be in Kroger? You want to be in Food Line? Like, where do you want to be and where do you envision yourself? So just try to think about those things enough not to get stuck, but enough so that you're talking to the right people you're putting the right ingredients in your product, right? So another thing, like I'm very big on like organic, better for you. Um, we have unenriched, un unbleached flour. I've always eaten like that. Like I made this mix out of my, you know, ingredients that were in my house. So that's okay. been very important to me. But what I didn't think about starting this is what does that look like? when you're scaling. Mm, at scale, yeah. Right, I can go get the ingredients now, right? And I have, you know, a good relationship with suppliers, but even now it's like to get to the next level if you're gonna go into co-packing, right? Where someone else is manufacturing for you, you know, the point of doing that is to drive costs down. So if they don't have the products that you're wanting to use and you're the only person that needs that, you know, product, you're still probably looking at the same cost, right? On top of whatever costs they're charging to make the product. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it's like you're still in a weird situation. So just being mindful of as much as you can think about without preventing yourself from moving forward, right? Just kind of be mindful of those things. That's good. I want to ask you, um, with the brand, as you grew, at what point did you feel like, because you talk about like it's a point where, you know, you were, you know, still heavily in corporate, making that money, you know what I'm saying? And then try to build a thing on the <laughs> side. At what point did you feel like, okay, this is legit? Or um, at least, you know, like even if it hasn't reached the, all the goals you have yet of it, yeah. like like this has legs and it's moving in the right direction. Like was there a certain time, a certain instance or something that happened? So I'm very intuitive and I do not, okay, recommend being intuitive and running your business on intuition. <laughs> But something was telling me, like, if you do not let go of, like, I, I just felt like I was, like, one leg in, one leg out. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't, even though I had autonomy in my corporate job, I still, like, mentally was, like, them people had me. I couldn't get out. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? I was, like, I just couldn't. It was, like, one or the other. Yeah. You know, you're either going to go all in for X amount of time and give yourself a, a deadline, or you're going to stick to the corporate thing. Because mm -hmm. I just could not 
I couldn't do both. You know, it's like something was going to suffer. So I had um, a significant order. I thought it was so big at the time, but now, now I'm, I'm like, at that. like, what was I doing? <laughs> I'm like, why we, why, why we couldn't do that? Um, <laughs> right. I'm like, I don't know why I thought it was so big, but it was like so big. And I was like, oh my gosh, I'm not going to be able to fulfill this. But I was still working. And so at that point I realized like, okay, girl, if we're looking at this, you know what I'm saying? Like every month or every, whenever it comes in, like we got to let this, this corporate thing go. We can't, you know, do both because I mean, it was just no way. Right. I just was fatigued. I didn't have um, the mental capacity to deal with. Like, I mean, I had a real, you know, career like yes, where I was correct. like, I had to like research and be involved and engaged. And I just, I couldn't do both. So I think that that big order, okay. <laughs> I think that was probably like the turning point. Um, and then too, so when I had my boutique years ago, I was like doing like the specialty, like this little cutesy stuff that it was like, girl, you should be just sell, just sell some fashion overdresses, right? Like don't do all this <laughs> fancy stuff. So it was harder to like scale and see traction. But when with this business, like people were like, you know, people are like calling and email, like you got that pancake mix. Like you, like I just oh, wow. felt like I could see more of like the scalability. Yeah. Um, and like the need, right? Versus what I had experienced in the past. So That's good. it was so, just so little... again, that previous experience of what you had been through, yes. right? Gives you some something to leverage it against to say, hey, you know what? Well, it just feels different. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like it feels like it has more legs. It feels like it has more momentum and then been able to make moves based off of that. Yes, I definitely. So recently you had the opportunity to be on QVC. I did. What was <laughs> what was that like? Because QVC agents and like like those companies are machine. They are sales machines. Yes, um, they are. And I'm sure, right? I don't know if you get like the first time I had uh, a good friend of mine, Mario Armstrong. Shout out to Mario. Uh, he was on, and I was like just randomly was like flipping through, <laughs> and he was on like HSN I think one night uh, on behalf of Beats by Dre. Okay. Selling like Beats by Dre headphones, just like at the height of Beats by Dre, and I would just text him like, "Bro, like, what is it like? You know what I'm saying?" <laughs> and he's like. If you think it's crazy <laughs> from your side, you have no idea what it's like on the other end of it, right? Right. What was that experience like for you and for Barlow's Foods? Yeah, so it was crazy. Um, but it definitely, we prepared, like we did such a great job. Like when I tell awesome. you, um, it was a that was a very busy like that week that it aired, right? That I went live. Um, like that week in itself was just insane. It was so many different things going on. I don't really know how I managed to get through that week. And I said, never again will I operate like that. But um, it was it was crazy, you know, but I planned and I literally made sure like, OK, you know, by this date, you know, this component of this bundle needs to be, you know, packaged or set aside, like just trying to have as many deadlines within that process as possible. Yeah. So that literally like the week or a week, the week or two weeks before I was like, OK, at this point, we're just filling boxes, you know, because I already knew that we were going to sell out. You know, I had already spoke that into existence. And I'm like, for, for whatever reason, <clears throat> excuse me, if we do not, then we'll have to, you know, there's a plan B to, you know, get rid of this bundle basically because yeah. we did a, a pancake breakfast bundle on the show but we just pretty much had everything in order so when those orders started coming in um it's like you go live and then the orders don't really drop like they may trickle in a little bit but you get like a load of orders that just drop because they hold them and mm. they drop like the following day mm. so at first i was like what happened like nobody did i not present <laughs> well you know what i mean what's going on within the next day it was like 1400 orders, you know, wow. um, or 1700 orders, like, and it was just crazy. But we already had everything, you know, palleted out. Um, and it was just a matter of printing the labels, sticking them on the package, you know, and <clears throat> excuse me, and getting them on the truck and getting them out of there. But um, like the actually the actual online um, experience it was so fun. I had such a good time. I feel like I think that might be in my future. Okay. Being hey, there you go. <laughs> presenting um, and just talking, but it was just, it was a lot of fun. Like that was probably my favorite part was just really getting on air, being able to share the Barlow's food story and just to interact and engage with the host. They were a ton of fun. And, and I love that because the thing that's interesting to me about the brand too, is the fact that it has a story. Yes. And you know, I, I tell you all the time, right? Like, like so much of selling and storytelling. And I think a lot of times product-based businesses miss that. 
like they think like you only need a story if you're speaking on stages or if you're going into, you know, a conference room and selling, you know, something to, you know, decision makers. Yes. But like a great product with a story is a product that stands out on the shelf. A great product with a story is a product that people are willing to pay more for. Right. And not, you know, racing to the bottom with price wars with Amazon or other, you know, whoever, whoever other people may be. Yeah. Because it's always somebody that can beat you at cost. But, you know, I feel like how you build loyalty and affinity towards a product brand is through the story. Yes. And even so much of what we see on the shelf um, doesn't have a story with it. You know, even if it's ingrained in it, it's like there's no story with it. So I love what you built with the story. I love what you've been able to do. I love how you pulled it all together. So tell me, um, two or three tips that you give to, um, again, new entrepreneurs that are saying, you know, her ideas inspired me. I want to get started. Like, like I'm getting going today. Do it, right? Mm. Like seriously, just do it and just see what happens. Look, we're all not going to be here at some point, right? So I just feel like just do whatever, you know, as long as you're not going to do nothing crazy, then. <laughs> <laughs> as long as you ain't about to go mess with nobody, right? Or do anything, you know, that is not good, then I say go for it. Like, why not? Just try it um, and see and see what happens. And more than likely, I feel like the first time probably shouldn't be the time and it may not be. So like get started so you can hurry up and get to whatever that it is going to be, right? Because I think it takes a couple of times for us to kind of fall down, learn, get back up. So you just want to fail quick, get out there and, you know, just go for it. Like, why not? I love it. And yeah. tell me what's next for Ballos Foods? Because, you know, you started with the uh, mix that we talked about, which we didn't mention is actually pancake and it's a biscuit mix. Yeah, so it's a three-in-one, well. so you can do pancakes, biscuits, and waffles, and you can do so much more with it, but like, and everything tastes like amazing across the board. So yeah. a lot of products you'll find where they, you know, mask, because they can do multiple things. Like, one would be really good, and then the other ones you like, I, you know, you could have say that. This ain't really important. <laughs> they just put that on the package. It's right. a sales, you, a sales <laughs> tool, right? You could have wrote something else on the packaging. But um, no, so it tastes good across the board. Um, but yeah, started with the original mix. Um, and it's just that very like nostalgic, that home style taste that if you are from the South or you got some Southern folks in California, okay, that it's just like that home style. It tastes like someone literally like made it from scratch. And that's basically what we did, right? We just made it easier, more convenient for people by packaging it. Um, but yeah, so we um, launched our peach cobbler syrup, which people love. So we launched that last year. And we're starting to do more seasonal syrup. So we have like our strawberries and blueberries um, during those seasons. We have a maple now. Uh, we have some fun stuff that um, has been released for the holidays. So super excited about that. Going into some flavor options um, and then dietary specific with our gluten-free mix that will be um, available soon. So Awesome. And yeah. what's the big vision? What's the big, big vision for all those? So I want to be like the Coca-Cola, right? But of... I guess, CPG pancake mix. I don't know. Uh, but like, I feel like when I was growing up, like now, right, I'm like, if I see a package or if I taste something, like it literally trends, like makes me back into time, right? So that is what I want. I want people to see like that red, that, you know, that cursive, that packaging. And it, they remember, you know, having a meal with their grandparents or making, you know, I don't know, Sunday breakfast with their mom and their dad. Like, I just really want it to be like that iconic, like that moment in time. Um, and just something that we, you know, as a people have and that we're, we're proud to be associated with. Um, and also just something that, you know, people don't feel guilty about eating. Cause I mean, you would never know, right? If I didn't tell you that it was a better, cleaner product, you wouldn't know. Um, because Correct. it tastes, you know, great. So yeah, just an iconic brand, um, something that will be around for just many, many generations to come beyond me. So I love it. I love it. And then last but not least, how can they get in touch with you? How can they find out more about Barlow's Foods and how can they get their hands on the actual products? Yes. So we are in about 70 stores, I want to say, um, in the Southeast region. So you can go to our website at barlowsfoods.com and you can see a list of all the locations that we're in. You can also find us online on our website and social is at Barlow's Foods. I love it. Yes. And check it out, y'all. I am telling you, I've tasted <laughs> the stuff. I've eaten it, right? Uh, the very first time, don't tell nobody, the very first time Ronnie's out of town, I had my mother-in-law make them. Oh, okay. Right. And Ronnie came back was like, with a pancake mix. I'm like, I don't know. Your mama made some pancakes. Pancakes were delicious out here. 
right? <laughs> um, but they're delicious. I'm a repeat customer, right? We've got the syrups too. The syrups are delicious. Make sure you get your hands on them. Make sure you support them. You know, something um, that I didn't talk about, I'll say real quick, is that many of us, the pancakes we've grown up eating have actually been derogatory towards us and our culture. But we've just been so ingrained, like it's so ingrained in American culture. Right. We literally are eating products that's offensive towards us to where now, even though these companies knew they were offensive, are just changing and rebranding right. the names, right? Um, so it's time for us to, you know, uh, not even just make a shift in what we think, but make a shift in what we eat and support those that support us. So I'm telling you, go out and get the bottles of foods. Highly recommend it. Thank you for joining us Thank today. Thank you so much. It's been an amazing it's episode. And you've just clocked in for another episode of the Traffic Sales and Profit Show. Thanks for listening to another episode of the Traffic Sales and Profit Show. Hey, do me a favor. If you enjoyed what you heard today, subscribe and follow us on this platform right now to make sure you do not miss a beat as we drop new episodes and additional content every single week. Also, if you'd like to get access to a free paperback copy of my book, access to the TSP Traffic Sales and Profit free Facebook group, our challenges, resources, our events, and more, make sure you visit us at www.trafficsalesandprofit.com forward slash podcast.